itself, Pilgrim's Progress continues to be one of the most widely read and influential books ever written. Translated into many languages, released in a continuing variety, Bedford, England, now a thriving industrial community, looked like this when John Bunyan walked these very streets during the mid to latter years of the 17th century. One remarkably well-preserved building, where some say the writer took part in parachurch worship, now serves as the Bunyan Museum. Here the visitor finds a replica of the kind of living room one might have seen in the Bunyan home. Both his birthplace and the house where he lived no longer exist. The museum, known as Moot Hall, does contain such Bunyan memorabilia as the actual pulpit, from which the young man heard sermons which profoundly influenced his life and thought. Also the door to one of the two Bedford prisons where he spent one-fifth of his life and where he wrote his famous book. Faithful to his church, this church, Bunyan was not content to receive his spiritual food from sermons alone. Though he brought his family to this sanctuary faithfully each Sunday, he also became an avid student of the scriptures himself. It was this study of the Bible which caused him to ask many questions about the conduct of the church as well as of his own lifestyle. For example, he served for a time as the Sunday morning bell ringer, a task he enjoyed so immensely he came to think of it as sinful. He feared lest one day when he entered the tower to ring the bell, it might come crashing down upon him in divine judgment. Elstow, the little village adjacent to Bedford where Bunyan actually lived, was a religious center in his day. This spacious abbey became a kind of community social structure as well as religious. Though a stained glass window in the church now commemorates the author and his book, John Bunyan, from his study of the Bible, came into sharp disagreement with the church. Many of the scenes in his Pilgrim's Progress not only depict Bunyan's personal struggles, but also the inequities he saw in the established church. As this plaque commemorates, he paid dearly for his disagreements with the religious leaders of his day. A small jail, part of the entrance to Bedford, stood on this bridge. Here, during the year he spent as a prisoner, John Bunyan began the writing of Pilgrim's Progress. Today, the descendants of the community hold him in honor. Then, it was a different story. For John Bunyan dared to speak out against hypocrisy. Although never brought to a proper trial, he spent 11 more years in the main prison of Bedford. It was during this time he completed his book. John Bunyan lies buried in one of the storied old cemeteries to be found in the city of London. Nearby rest the remains of another famous author, who is said to have been strongly influenced by Bunyan's writings. In a much less pretentious resting place, overlooked by most visitors to the cemetery, can be found the grave of Susanna Wesley, mother of the two famous brothers, John and Charles. Still one more famous man lies buried here, a man profoundly influenced by the book Pilgrim's Progress. His name, Isaac Watts, writer of many of the most treasured hymns in the Christian church. Today, scholars still try to fathom the motivations and to understand the greatness of the man John Bunyan. We shall simply occupy ourselves with a visualization of his famous story, Pilgrim's Progress.
wages, death, wages, death, wages, wages, death, death. The wages of sin is death, is death, wages, death, wages, death, wages, wages, death, death. Oh Lord, what must I do to be saved? The wages, the wages of sin is death, is death. Wages, death, wages, death, wages, wages, death, death. The wages of sin is death, is death. The soul that sins must die, must die. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sins must die, must die. The wages of sin is death. The burden of his sins, sore and heavy upon his back, Pilgrim had forsaken the city of destruction to set out in search of the celestial city. He was prepared to face whatever obstacle might come in his way, even death itself. Not only did Pilgrim bear the heavy burden upon his back, but the road he must travel held many pitfalls and dangers, many trials and disappointments. And added to these, indeed the cause of much of these, would be his great enemy, the enemy of his very soul. In contrast to the burden upon his back, the traveler carried a book, the very book of life. It was the message of this book which had caused him to leave the city of destruction. But although the enemy of his soul would continually seek to disrupt his journey, there would also be those to counsel and guide him. May I help you, Pilgrim? I have been watching you. You seem very troubled. I am very troubled. This book tells me of a great judgment coming down from heaven. I tried to warn my wife and children, my friends and neighbors, but they wouldn't listen to me. The judgment of which you speak is true. You are wise to heed the warning. Let me introduce myself. My name is Evangelist. Evangelist. Then perhaps you can help me. You see, I'm not ready for God's judgment. That's why I left the city of destruction. Why do you stand here? Because I don't know where to go. How kind, sir? How can I escape God's judgment? Here is a key. It is the key of promise. Do you see that gate in the distance? No, sir, I don't. Do you see a light? I think I do. Good. Go directly toward that light. It will lead you to a gate. When you come to the gate, knock, and you will be told what to do. The people living in darkness, in darkness, in darkness, have seen a great light. A great light. A great light. In, In the, the shadow, shadow of death. death. The shadow of death. A light has dawned. A light has dawned. A light has dawned.
A neighbor in the city of destruction, pliable by name, took it upon himself to find Pilgrim and bring him back to his wife and family. In reality, Pilgrim had not left his family. Instead, his wife, influenced by the scoffing of their neighbors, refused to flee with her husband from the condemned city. me to introduce myself. My name is Obstinate. My name is uh, Pliable. Uh, pliable. Pliable? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Fine family, the Pliables. I know the name. Fine family. I I I'm trying to catch up to Pilgrim. Pilgrim? Pilgrim? I don't believe I ever heard the name. He just left this morning. He left his wife and his children and his friends. Pity, pity, such a pity. Much too much of that sort of thing these days, isn't there? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Much too much. Can you help me? I've got to bring Pilgrim back to his wife and children. Bring him back to sanity, you mean to say? <laughs> but of course I can help you. I uh, specialize in helping chaps like you. I do, I do. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Now, when we catch up with this weak-minded fellow, you might best leave the talking to me. I've had a lot of experience with his kind. Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about. Your adversary, the devil, walks about. Your adversary, the devil, Ah, oh, there you are, Pilgrim. I've come all the way. I told you to let me do the talking. Oh, yes, Mr. Obstinate. Sorry, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, well, what a pleasure. You are Pilgrim, I believe. Pilgrim. Ah, yes. Fine people, the pilgrims. Yes, 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 I know the family well. Fine people. But you said... Oh, Was there something you're wanting of me? We want you to go back to the city of... Dis to your wife and children. I cannot go back. Our city is a city of destruction. It is to be destroyed by the judgment of God. <laughs> Complete nonsense. People have been saying that for years. Believe me, I know. And judgment has never come. Never, never, never. Nor will it ever come. No, no. What about Noah? As it was in the days of Noah, so also... Noah? Noah? Can't say I've ever heard the name. And I know all the important families, believe me. Now be sensible, my friend, and come back home. Pilgrim, 
<laughs> a fine name. Yes, yes, yes. Don't disgrace it. Go back to the city of destruction? I cannot. Why don't you come with me? We can escape the judgment of God together. We can escape the judgment of God? Yes, we can. Nonsense. Preposterous, idiotic, fanatical, impossible nonsense. Is it nonsense, Pilgrim? Not nonsense, Pliable. Eternal truth. In this book, it says we must seek for an inheritance that never fades away. Inheritance? The only way to get an inheritance is to go back to your families. Yes, yes, back to your families. How about it, Pilgrim? Are you coming with us or not? I cannot turn back. All right then, Pliable. Let's go home without him. Uh, uh, I, I, I think I should go with Pilgrim. Follow that sick-brained fellow? Or come back, Pliable, and be wise. We can escape the judgment of God. Judgment of God. <coughs> it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. Do you think the words of your book are certainly true, Pilgrim? As the book itself says, they're written in the hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began. What other things does the book say, Pilgrim? We are promised an everlasting salvation. We may earn a crown of righteousness. There shall be no more sorrow or crying. He that is owner of the place will wipe all tears from our eyes. Will people scoff at us there? No, Pliable. Wonderful, wonderful. And who will be at this place? Thousands and ten thousands who have gone before us. They're all loving and holy. Everyone walking in the sight of God, acceptable unto him forever. I can't wait to get there. I don't like being scoffed at, Pilgrim. Don't worry, Pliable. They're the children of darkness. Pilgrim, I'm hungry and thirsty. Pardon me, sir. There we have some water. The journey's not as I expected it would be, Pilgrim. The book doesn't promise an easy journey, but it does promise a wonderful destination. <laughs> Reach this place. I can't go any faster because of this burden on my back. Perhaps we should find a place to sleep for the night. No, Pilgrim, let's hurry on. I can't wait to find this place your book tells about. In his foolish eagerness, Pliable put from his mind such lurking dangers as the slough of despond. 
an iniquitous swamp into which many a foot-weary pilgrim had fallen prey to the wiles of the evil one. This is a strange way for both of us. We must watch our step in the darkness. Is this the wonderful place your book speaks of? If it's like this at the journey's beginning, what will it be like at the end? Help me! Help me! My burden is pulling me deeper into the mire! I leave you to possess the beautiful kingdom your book talks about. Help! Help! My name is Help. I heard you calling. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I met a man who told me to come this way. His name is Evangelist. But you should not have gone alone in the darkness. The slough of Despond is filled with the scum and filth of man's wickedness. Sinners who were awakened to their lost condition but have fears and doubts often fall into this terrible place. And you rescue such people? If they will permit me to. Where sin abounds. God's grace much more abounds. Those words are in this book. I must leave you now. But just up above, you will find a place of shelter for the night. Pilgrim continued upon his way as the enemy of his soul increased his efforts against the traveler. You seem to be hungry. Come to my little cottage. We'll fix you something to eat. Some food, some food. Yes, yes, yes. How rude of me. My name is Wiseman, worldly Wiseman. My name is Pilgrim. Pilgrim? Pilgrim? Oh, yes, 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 yes. That name sounds familiar. But of course, of course, fine people, the pilgrims, fine people indeed. You, of course, will have heard of my family. We are high stock, we are, if I do say so. Oh, yes, yes. Ask us anything, anything you like, and you will find the answer. For instance, how did you come by that pack upon your back? There's a gate I must find, and when I find it, I'll be told how to be rid of this burden. <laughs> and who told you about any such gate? Someone I met along the way. His name is Evangelist. Evangelist? 
Dullards, the whole lot of them. They are pilgrim. Dullards, dullards. You follow the way this evangelist directs, and all kinds of misery await you. Hunger, perils, nakedness, the sword. Didn't he also talk about a cross? <laughs> His way, utter foolishness. But the burden I carry is so great, Mr. Wiseman. I would gladly face all these things you speak of, if at the end of my journey, I may be delivered from this burden. And how did you come by this burden in the first place? By reading this book. I should have known. Should have. Should have. You would one day name me your greatest friend if I toss this book into my fire. I will go. But wait, wait, you haven't eaten. Precocity, bring the food. Wait, wait, I want to help you. I perceive you are a religious man, which is good, good, very good. The world needs more religious people. It does, Pilgrim, it does. Do you see that hill just yonder? At the top of that hill is the village of Morality. It's a lovely little place, lovely, lovely. I wish I lived there myself. I do, Pilgrim, I do. Only it doesn't quite suit me. But a dear friend of mine lives there, Mr. Legality. It's the first house at the top of the hill. Mr. Legality will show you how to be rid of that burden of yours. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. What are you doing here? Why have you so quickly turned aside from the way? I met a gentleman who told me how I might be rid of this burden I carry. But you have read the words in the book. Those words are alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? I have sinned. I have sinned. Be not faithless, pilgrim, like those who walk the broad road to destruction. Remember, the just shall live by faith. Worldly wise men try to bring eternal condemnation upon you. First, he turned you from the way, from the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Second, he tried to make the cross an offense to you. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to those who would escape destruction, pilgrim, 
The preaching of the cross is the power of God unto salvation. Is there any hope for me? Of the book. By grace you are saved. Through faith, through faith. Not of works. The gift of God. Saved through faith. The gift of God. Saved through faith. The gift of God. By the deeds of the law shall no one be justified. Saved through faith. The gift of God. The wicked are like the troubled sea. And it cannot rest. And it cannot rest. The wicked are like the troubled sea. And it cannot rest. The wicked are like the troubled sea. And it cannot rest. The wicked are like the troubled sea. And it cannot rest. And it cannot rest. And it cannot rest. Seek, seek, and you shall find, and you shall find. Knock, knock. It shall be opened, it shall be opened. Seek, seek, and you shall find, and you shall find. Knock, knock. It shall be opened, it shall be opened. Good evening, my friend. I am Mr. Goodwill. Who are you? And from where have you come? And to where are you going? My name is Pilgrim. I am a burdened sinner from the city of destruction, seeking the way to eternal life. You seek the way, do you, Pilgrim? You are very wise. Come. I will show you. How is it you travel alone, Pilgrim? Because no one would listen when I warned of the coming judgment. My friends and neighbors laughed at me, my own family. So it is, too often in this world. Please, Mr. Goodwill, might you be able to help me take this burden from my back? The answer is in the book you carry. And just up the way, you will find the house of Mr. Interpreter. Go to him, Pilgrim. He will help you. I thank you. Thank you. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow the way that leads to life. Broad is the way to destruction. Destruction. Narrow the way to life. To life. Broad is the way to destruction. Destruction. Narrow the way to life. To life. Come in. I have been waiting for you. Here in the house of Mr. Interpreter, Pilgrim would at last receive the information needed to assure the success of his journey. For like the golden key the traveler carried in his pocket, Mr. Interpreter's words would open Pilgrim's mind to the wisdom and treasures in the book. Anticipation came like the warming sun to the young man's seeking heart. What is the meaning of this picture? The man in the picture says with the apostle, my dear children, for whom I am in the pains of childbirth until Christ be formed in you. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And the crown above his head, this is to show that as also may we, he can say with the apostle, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. After we are set free from our sins, we must fight the good fight. We must finish the course. Then there will be waiting for us a crown of righteousness. Come, let me show you more. You wonder about the burden on your back. That I do, Mr. Interpreter. I surely do. This floor is like the heart of man before he experiences the power of the gospel, which is the very power of God unto salvation. The dust is the sin in every heart. The broom represents the law, or you might also say the effort by good works to justify your sins. But the book you hold in your hand tells you 
By the works of the law shall no one be justified. Only the power of the gospel can take away sin. If any man be in Christ, your book tells you, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. No. Yes, Mr. Interpreter had shown the way, his words like a lamp in a place of darkness. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but the words of this book shall never pass away. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You must be born again. It is by grace you are saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, you pilgrim, through his poverty, might become rich. So that you his poverty might become rich so that you through his poverty might become rich so that you through his poverty He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity. His suffering brings us peace. By his strength, we are healed. Father, forgive them. Forgive me. By this gospel you are saved, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. The words of this book shall, shall never pass away. Your name shall no longer be pilgrim. Your name shall now be Christian. now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets us free from the law of sin and death. No longer pilgrim, but now Christian. The traveler continued his sure steps toward the celestial city. Hello, my friend and brother. May I journey with you? 
My name is Faithful. I also walk in the way. It was as though Christian and Faithful had been brothers since birth. So unique is this kinship of the Spirit, this oneness in a faith which makes all who so believe members of the same family. Together they shared past experiences, the difficulties they had faced, the blessings they had known, and together they looked with anticipation and confidence toward the continuation of their journey. Be like-minded, having the same love. Be one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain deceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. You also fell into the slough of despond. Did you faithful? But worse than that, at the foot of the hill of difficulty, I met first Adam, who lives in the town of deceit. He offered me his three daughters. Beautiful they were, as the world sees beauty. What were their names? Their names? <laughs> lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Did you... Did you resist them, Faithful? By the grace of God, I did. How true are the words of the book. Let us beware the snare of the fowler. Did I not quote from the book saying, let us beware of the snare of the fowler? You did. We had no evil intentions. Why were we caught in Satan's net? Because we are mortals. But listen, I quoted from the book incorrectly. It reads here of our Lord. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Deliver us, Christian, from this? Yes, faithful, he will deliver us. It is a promise of his book, and not one of his promises has ever been broken. He delivered me from my strong enemy. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith. It was a great deliverance, a time for joy and wonderment. But then, from across the nearby hills, came the sounds of Vanity Fair. Go. You are in the world, but not of the world. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men. I said in my heart, enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I made great works, I built houses, I planted vineyards, I gathered silver and gold. Vanity Fair, so like so much of the world, where people look to shallow laughter, and the dust of things to sham and shadow for their satisfaction. Just trying to catch me off guard.
しい！
I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. Bring the torch. Let him burn. Your name is Hopeful. It suits you well. For many years, my heart was full of an empty hope. But now, through your book, I have the hope of eternal life. My eyes have never before seen such wonders. Surely the enemy of our souls is far from this place. Not only was the enemy near, but as the two travelers came upon Bypath Meadow, hopefulness took beauty for truth in their search to follow the right way. Wait, see how pleasant it is this way. Come on, Christian. See that storm ahead of us. We're still going the wrong way, hopeful. There's a shepherd's shelter. Look, Christian, a castle where we might have found shelter for the night. Perhaps we can find something to eat.
to Doubting Castle. I am your host, Giant Despair! How could it be two travelers who had been so intent upon their search for the celestial city? What will happen to us? Our fate will be like theirs. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. You shall know the truth. The truth. The, the truth. truth. The truth shall set you free. Set you free. Set you free. The key. The key of promise. It will open any door. Set you free. Set you free. You shall know the truth. The truth. The truth. The truth shall set you free. Set you free. Set you free. Bypath Meadow, a pleasant way, but the wrong way. Only a few steps farther had Christian and Hopeful continued on the right way, and they would have been spared the grief of Doubting Castle. They could have entered much sooner into that beauteous terrain which marked the beginning of the end of their journey. In this beautiful place of fruit and flowers, milk and honey, Christian and Hopeful came upon the shepherd's camp. But more than shepherds they were, much more. They were guardians and guides, true friends and true brothers. Welcome. This is Emmanuel's land. My name is Knowledge. My name is Watchful. My name is Experience. My name is Sincere. I am Christian, and this is my companion, Hopeful. Since this is Emmanuel's land, we must be nearing the Celestial City. Aye, that you are. Quickly, Watchful, let us show them. Look, Hopeful, look. Look 
Come, Christian. We must be on our way. It is yet a long journey. And you have traveled a great distance. Stay here and rest a while. How can we delay? We must go. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. You see, Hopeful, even our Lord Jesus was tempted by the great evil one. But of course, Jesus was in the desert. This is like an endless garden. This is Emmanuel's land. Surely when one has come this far, he's immune to Satan's attack. battle is not yours. Christian had read these words many times in the book. The battle is the Lord's. And if the battle is the Lord's, so also the victory. Thus it was, their journey completed. The time came for Christian and Hopeful to enter the celestial city. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have the faith. Now there is in store for me. I lost them. They should have been mine. As so many of these are mine. That one over there, mine. Those three. 
That one there. Yes, and that one. Ah. Now it was time to look for others. Those yet vulnerable. Those he hoped to win. And winning, take unto himself. There's a possible victim. Of course. Of course. You. Have a, a pure heart, a clean heart, a forgiving heart, and that that is a that's a bottom foundation of everything. So we must have that forgiveness, forgiving the people. So forgive, and you will be forgiven. And it's pretty easy to ask forgiveness when you forgive others, because you get in a it's a flow. In other words, somebody does something, and sometimes it might be a little rough. Not that they do something, but hey, not my will, but Thy will. So I will forgive you, Lord. And when you forgive, it's not because you feel like it. You might feel like popping them one. But yet, because the Lord says you must forgive and act of your free will, you do it. Go like Jesus. You know, when he was going to the cross uh, in, in uh, Gethsemane, he was at the place there. He didn't want to go, but he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And that's what gives you and I, gave you and I the victory over that will that I taught on last week there when he swept the drops of blood. That uh, Whenever he was there agonizing, going to the cross, those drops of blood covered us, we have the ability to say, not my will, but your will, Father, no matter what we face. That gives us the strength and the ability through the Holy Ghost to do like he did there, you see. And we're never going to have anything excruciating like that that we say, Lord, never let's not my will, but thine, because Jesus went through the ultimate. So need to keep that in mind. Need to keep that in mind. Okay, the next thing is temptation and evil. Now, as you read that there, and you know that would be ridiculous as it is in the King James. There. It says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, when does God lead us into temptation? So you see, there's the, the King James is a translation. And it's not a perfect translation. That's why you look in the Hebrew and the Greek, because God is not a tempter. You can't tempt God, and he doesn't tempt you. Lead us not into temptation. I'm not going to say, Father, don't lead me to temptation. You don't lead me to temptation. The Lord tests us. He doesn't tempt us. He never tempts us. The devil is the tempter. God tests us, but he doesn't tempt us. So what that actually means right there, to show you another thing in there, what it's actually meaning, is don't let us fall into temptation by the enemy that will take us and draw us aside. And don't let him come against us to, to ruin what we're doing. In other words, protect us there in that situation. Because you're not going to lead us into him. You're going to protect us. And that's really what it's saying to us. Of course, he's given us uh, authority over the devil. He's given us power of the devil. We have authority over the spirits. So we have the authority to cast them out, to cast them down, and to say no to them, you see. And we have the authority over our will. So we have the authority over our will. We have the authority over the devil. We don't have authority over the others, per se, to force them into anything because God doesn't even use that. A person's will, you, you can't force somebody's will. Well, that's one thing we never do. In fact, that's called witchcraft when I try to force somebody's will into doing something I want, you say. But uh, when it comes to the devil, when it comes to your will, you have authority where you can say, no, I'm going to do what the Father wants, and you can say, get out, devil, in the name of Jesus, and he'll go. Okay? Now, he says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Well, this is an ongoing thing, the power and the glory. And, you know, when we're in heaven, we're going to be in the power and the glory of God. We're going to be in that presence. And there won't be any effort to anything. We're going to be there. There will be no more pain, suffering, trials, tribulations, or anything. But on this earth is where you and I are facing these obstacles. This is sort of like a proving ground to you and I. In fact, it is a proving ground. God gave us a free will to make a free choice, you see. And he's made provisions with his son, through his son, with the plan of salvation, which gives us the, uh, the ability to live an abundant and fruitful life, as, as Jesus said in, uh, in uh, John 10, 10, I've come to, you might have life, you might have it more abundantly. 
And he's offered us all that. He's given us the offer that we cannot refuse. But I think what happens a lot of times, people uh, see uh, other people, and what they're reflecting as Christianity is not too appetizing to them. They're not really showing the real Jesus that brings an impression. You know yourself. There's people out here right now, and I know you know what I'm talking about, many of you. There's things that you've done sometimes that has moved the hearts of people, and you knew it was something the Lord had you do, and it moved their hearts. It touched their hearts. This is what we're talking about here, and it's doing what the Holy Spirit leads you to do, obeying the Word, because when you obey the Word of God, you listen to the Holy Spirit and just do what He wants, and you walk in love towards people, uh, what you do will be anointing, and it's going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference, you see. It will make a difference. And I'll tell you this, there's a greater anointing that's coming on God's people to are obedient now. I'm personally seeing it in a powerful way. These past couple of weeks have been uh, special times, and it's progressively going into what God had promised because we're the last day remnant. God's anointing his people to go forth like never before. It's a stronger anointing. What it is, it's an anointing of power, his power in us, and also an anointing for finances. They're the two major things, plus healings and miracles and things. And many things are happening now. I- I'm seeing them happen, not even seeing them. Matter of fact, you won't even recognize the power of God in you all the time, the anointing through you, until somebody testifies to you what happened when you ministered to them. That's what the other day I had that happen to me where I didn't recognize it because it's not like you're having any great feelings all the time or goosebumps or something like that, but you're just simply flowing along. But God puts his anointing on it, and sometimes you sense it very strongly. Other times that you don't. I've seen God open blind eyes, and nobody fell out under the Spirit, laid hands and ministered to him, and uh, nothing uh, extraordinary. Did anybody thought anything magnificent happened, jumping all over the place? blind out open. I've seen these things happen so many times, you know, and it's not in our outward gyrations all the time to get the job done. It's by the anointing. Not by power and might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Zechariah 4, 6. And by the Holy Ghost and by the Holy Spirit, God is setting you free tonight as the Lord prayed, because as the Lord prayed his prayer, thy will be done in your life on earth as it is in heaven. God's will be done in your life is on this earth as it already is set up for in heaven. I want you to show me in this earth here, Jesus said. I want you to show me. I want you to demonstrate me. I want you to receive my blessings in your life. I want you to use those blessings and, and sow those blessings to others that people will see my love and my goodness in mankind. He wants to show his love and goodness through you. He blesses you to be a blessing. He wants you prosperous financially, physically, mentally, in every way, anointing-wise, in every area that you can give, that you can give of what you have because he didn't give it to you to hoard. He gave it to you to enjoy and to give back out, and that's what this is all about. So what I'm going to do tonight is I do this again. I'm going to read the Lord's Prayer, and I want you to think about what we talked about here. And I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit is going to touch you where you need touch. I don't know what you need. I don't know. But the Holy Spirit knows. And I'm going to read this very slowly, these verses that I read earlier right here, verse Matthew 6, 9 through 13. And I'm going to read them slowly. I want you just to sit back there with your eyes closed right now. I want you to forget about anything. You'll hear my voice. But you're not thinking about me. You're just hearing the words. And you're thinking about Jesus. Just see Jesus there. I want you to focus on Jesus. And I'm going to read this. I want you to focus on him and open your hearts up. In fact, turn your hands around just as I read this. Because when you turn your palms up towards heaven, that's like open your hands so he can feel. He can feel you. That's receiving. I'm receiving from you, Lord. That's a sign of receiving. When you turn your hands around, you hold them in the air, that's receiving from him. I want you to do that as I read, and whatever he has for you, receive tonight. Whatever he has. I'm believing it because I know the anointing's here to do that very thing. And you will receive. Now, I'm going to ask you, too. Uh, you have the responsibility. The Bible says in Psalms 105.1 that we're to make known his deeds to the people, and I want you to contact 
uh, station right here. I have a website you can contact. It's on there uh, on my uh, program. It's on Reaching Out Radio right there. You'll see mine and, and Mont- Avengers Montel. You can contact her because hers is there. It's uh, recognizable. You can mark that. It, it makes no difference who you're notified. Just make sure it's notified because we want to honor the Lord with your testimonies, and we want to encourage others they see our God is real. That's that's the biggest thing to testify because the more testimonials that go forth, the greater it is because, hey, so many times people have requests but where the testimony is at. My God does sing. That's why this program, that's why the Lord gave me this program, God's Word in Action. It's not just God's Word. It's not just something we talk about and teach about and, oh, we believe this, we believe that. But, hey, it really works, folks. It really works. It brings forth fruit. It's a lifestyle that brings forth fruit and gives us the abundancy in all things and, and lifts us up above the clouds. Amen? Okay, are you all ready to receive right now? Amen. I am, I'm here with you receiving myself, too. Amen. Here we go. I want you to receive. Thank you, Lord. We just ask you just to move upon your people right now. Those, whatever the needs might be, as I read this here, that your anointing would just fall upon the people. As you instructed me to read this, Father, so I'm going to read it. And, Lord, we just release the Holy Spirit to do his work in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen, and amen, and amen. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. We just praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just praise him and thank him for meeting you right now, whatever your need was. Whatever your need Yes, yes. Whatever that need, whatever that need is. Yes, just keep those hands up there. Just keep those hands up there. And just allow the Holy Spirit to feed you and minister to you. It's just you and Jesus. Just you and Jesus, the atmosphere. The atmosphere is Jesus, you and Jesus, because he wants to do a work in your life. He wants your life to be on this earth as it would be in heaven. He wants it for you. It's his will. He desires it. He will make it happen. You just let him do it. Let him do it. Thank you, Lord. 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 Praise you, Jesus. Okay, okay, as we, here I'm going to share with you, I'm going to give you my email, and I know the other emails you'll have to uh, notify the broadcasting we have here, Reaching Out Radio, because it's very important that you tell what God has done in these programs, not just my program, but any program we have here, because, you know, we, we look at a microphone when we're, we're speaking. We don't see any faces. We're here uh, basically by ourselves, and... We don't know what's happening or what's going on, but we only know what we hear from you all. So please, I encourage you to participate. And we didn't have any calls tonight. Uh, Evangelist Montel is not here this evening. But that doesn't mean that you can't contact us because you need to really contact us. I'm going to give my number, and I know the others is down there too, and you can see it on Reaching Out Radio, uh, where there's a little write-up below the pictures. But uh, here's what my uh, website is, www tiny url that's t-i-n-y u-r-l dot com forward slash ed e-d e-b-e-r-l-y ed everly that's www dot tiny url dot com forward slash ed e-d everly e-b-e-r-l-y and that, that all goes together that's my website and you'll see incredible things on there is uh, there's been some incredible experiences. I've had. I just have a few of them there. I have one how God stopped a heart attack and the, literally a church building shook like it did in the book of Acts and different things that I've experienced, miracles. I have four of them on there, I believe it is. And tremendous things are on there and anything you need to know or want to know and 
a place you can go to. So just check that out. My book is on there, Overpowering Influence of the Truth. That's a powerful book that's touched people's lives from healing to sleepless nights uh, where they had insomnia and healed that. And we just, God has done so much through the book. I've had so many testimonies on it. So uh, you can check that out and how to order that book if you would like. And uh, my email, I'll give you that too. And like I say, it's all on the program here, but I'm going to say it because it's important that you communicate with the Reaching Out Radio and and with us that we know what's going on in your life. That's edward.eberly, the number two, at gmail.com. That's edward.eberly, the number two, at gmail.com. And through uh, these emails or the uh, website or whatever we can contact, we will know what's happening here. Because uh, if you need a telephone call, you want to talk on the phone, I do that also. I have to to communicate with you uh, by email, and then I will hook up with you if you need to talk to me or something. I'm here to minister to you. I do it constantly with people all over the place. I, I keep busy on that. So I do say to you whatever your needs might be, because I'm on this program for one reason only. That's to bring people to Jesus Christ and see him work in and through their lives. That's what my purpose is in service, to see people saved, healed, delivered, and on fire for Jesus Christ. And this is the greatest joy in my life, what I'm doing now, preaching and teaching the Word and see the power of God working in and through my life. That is, that is, that's my everything right there. That's everything. That's the most important thing in my life, Jesus Christ and then my wife and family. So... This is what I, I really, I know, yes, and God does that. We have to enter into him. We have to press in. And I've found, even as I'm speaking right now, it just busts and thrills my soul as I'm speaking, that how you enter in and you feel his presence. And this is, this is what he wants of us. He wants that. He inhabits the praise of his people, and that's a form of praise right there when you recognize him for who he really is. Okay, he says in uh, Matthew 6.10 there, Thy kingdom come. Okay, what is the kingdom of God? Well, Romans fourteen seventeen gives us the answer. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Okay, righteousness, peace, and joy. We're in right standing with God, righteousness, holiness of God, peace. We have that perfect peace. Jesus said, I don't come to give you peace as the world does, but peace I give to you, the world can't give to you. He gives you peace. That the peace you have, no matter what you're going through, you stand in peace. Peace that has nothing to do with your circumstances, your feelings, or anything about you. Peace. The peace the world gives you is the peace that you have when things are going good. When they go bad, you have, have hard times. You don't have peace. You have fear and worry and sleepless nights. But the peace God gives you is the peace that sustains anything that ever can or will come against you. And the joy is the same way, the joy of the Lord. That's being joyful, happy, at peace, and uh, just exuberant, and a smile on your face, and a a beautiful attitude, and not moved by what your circumstances in life are. You know, when you live a life like that, you're going to get your prayers answered a lot quicker. What happens is a lot of people lose joy, they lose peace, and then they're not really in faith because they're just crying out in their fleshly person, oh, I hurt, oh, I hurt. And, you know, they'll just pray like that, and they'll be, they'll be praying the problem instead of the answer. And when you pray, always remember, oh, Lord, heal my back, oh, my back, my, my back hurts, my back. You don't do that. You say, Lord, I thank you that by your stripes I'm healed. You sent your word to heal me and deliver me. I call and declare myself healed, and I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I thank you. That's how you attack the things that come against you in your life. Because if you speak the negative words out, you're speaking words of the devil. You're speaking fear words. And the more you speak, you hear it. And fear comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the devil. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? So you see, these things can be in reverse if you're not careful. And many people don't recognize that. They, sometimes they hurt so bad they just speak these things out and they don't consider them. They say, yeah, I'm believing for God to do this, do that. Well, we have to keep in in a mindset like that, folks. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He tells us in Romans 10.10, right? And that's how he steals from you and I, whenever we break down and give in to what we're feeling in our circumstances, you see. So you and I have to learn to get above that. 
Paul said he learned to be content in whatever state that he was in. That means he had the victory no matter if he was in good circumstances, bad or indifferent or whatever it might be. So we, you and I need to be consistent. Consistency is what God looks for. And if we want to win others to Jesus and impress people about Jesus, if they see you and I living consistently, they're going to look and they want to listen to what we have to say. But if they see us slacking like they do when times are good, we're praising the Lord and hallelujah. Things are bad, we're crying the blues. We see they'll, they'll say, hey, they don't have any more than I do. We tell people how powerful and mighty our Jesus is, and he is. He's ever been. He's more than we can say about him, but he's more than we ever say or are able to say. But yet, it isn't what we say, it's what we show them. Most of the people are like the old saying there that said, show me, I'm from Missouri. Well, that's what he wants you to do. Paul said, I'll show you my faith by my works. I'll show you my faith by my works. We show people what we are by the way we live our life, not by how we preach or how good-looking we are, or how good we are with words, or the miracles that take place to us, but our fruits. We're known by our fruits, the fruit of the Spirit. Fruits. Okay? Righteousness, peace, and joy, and the Holy Ghost. And these things aren't in us in the sense that we produce them ourselves. It's a Holy Ghost through us, you see. He said in the book of Romans 8.13, he said, The Spirit mortifies the deeds of the flesh. So if we die to the flesh and die to self, then we'll have these things because it's self that prevents you and I from having the joy that we're supposed to have, righteousness or peace. It's our self because we give in to what our feelings are, our emotions. So many people, and it just it, it breaks my heart, are led by their emotions. They'll act by their emotions. Or, and really, when you act by emotions, you're acting like a child. Really, because your emotions are going to be stupid things that you'll do. Somebody does something wrong, you get mad at them. You don't speak to them. You, you get away from them or something like that order. You just kind of get provoked at them. And, and that's not the way to be because, first of all, when you're in an attitude against somebody right there, you done cut yourself away from God right there. You done mess your prayer life up and your relationship, and there goes the peace, joy, and the righteousness, you say. Because we have to walk this walk in order to be recipient of what the promises are, the conditions of these promises. Okay, so the kingdom of God is this. Now, that is the most important thing we can have is the kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy, because in these things are everything else as far as materially, financially, uh, physically, you name it. It's all in there because we receive what we have on the outside need when we have the inside in order. That's inside these things, you see. And God works from the inside out. So you have yourself right inside and joyful and speaking that word, righteousness, peace, and joy. Then what you believe and confess in that word is going to come to pass in reality and manifest in your body if you ever need your finances or whatever it might be. That's going to happen for you, you see. But we have to have these things set. So often we're seeking the problem or the need instead of getting ourselves hooked on to Jesus, locked into Jesus by what he wants us to do, being in that place, that secret place of the Most High, that place with God. We aren't called to make a visit once in a while to the secret place or once in a while to pray. Many people just pray when they have a need, but God wants us to pray daily. What prayer is is simply talking to him. Sometimes we'll bring needs to him, and we'll ask him to strengthen us and anoint us and help us to be better soul winners and be more effective, greater anointing in our lives and to do more for the kingdom, what we our biggest prayer should be. But so often our prayer is, Lord, I need this, Lord, I need that. Uh, we need to be praying more for the face of God than the hand of God. In fact, if we start praying for the face of God more, we're not going to need to pray to the hand of God that much because doesn't he say in Matthew 6:33 to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all those things to be added to us. So we need to learn how to hook into these things because the church world uh, today in a lot of places, what I'm speaking about is foreign to most of them. I, I, I'm, I hate to say that, but it's the truth. I, it really saddens me when I'm around a lot of Christian people like that because I say, my Lord, they barely, they're barely saved. They, they had Jesus in their heart and they were going to go to heaven. But my, oh my, for the way they're to live here, how good a witness are they going to be? What are they showing to Jesus? Jesus wants us to, to show him. He wants to show himself to you and I. Okay? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? That is a big one there, folks. A lot of people read over that and they don't say much about it. But what is done in heaven? Is there any sickness in heaven? Is there poverty in heaven? Hate? 
lust, evil, sin? Of course not. It's all heaven, right? It's heaven. Jesus prayed, Lord, your will be done in this earth as it is in heaven. Be a little replica of what heaven will be. We recognize it's not going to be like heaven in, in the fullness of it, but it's a little dim view of it, just a little bit like uh, it speaks of uh, us looking through the glass darkly in the book of Corinthians. It, it'll be an image of it. They're going to see a lot. It's going to be mighty fine looking on earth, but it's nothing compared to what heaven will be because nothing is compared to heaven. So that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's bring that in a personal level. Let, let me bring it to my, just to me, okay? I'm not going to speak for anybody else. I have to speak for myself. So you need to apply this to you like I'm applying this to me. Thy will be done in Ed and earth as it is in heaven for Ed. Ed's well in heaven. Ed's prosperous in heaven. He has love. He has joy. He has peace. He's fruitful. He, he has everything in heaven. And I want Ed to live like that down here on earth. I want him to be the place he needs to be. Okay, well, how does Ed get there? Well, Ed gets there through the precious promises. That's why Jesus gave us all these promises, because he knew that you and I were going to be needing help, especially the more we do for Jesus and allow Jesus to work for, through us, the more help that we need. So therefore, he gives us all these precious promises on this earth that you and I will be able to receive what we have need of and accomplish his will be done in us on this earth that it is in heaven. You see, it isn't just a big group, like we say, with if only the church body would be on earth like it is in heaven. Well, that's great. That's, uh, that's where I like to see it, and I know you would too. But it begins with you. It begins with me. Is God's will on, in heaven being fulfilled on earth with me and you? Are we fulfilling the will of God in this earth? Am I at the place I need to be in all ways, spirit, soul, and body? So we need to examine ourselves. It's the will of Jesus. And Jesus did only the will of the Father. That you and I, will of God, would be done with us while we're on earth. Not just when we leave this earth. Like a lot of people say, well, boy, I'm just going through it now. It's horrible. Oh, I'm miserable. I'm sick. I'm defeated. Oh, come, Lord Jesus. Get me out of this mess. That's no way to go to heaven, folks. We're supposed to go out with a shout, not with a groan and a moan. I heard a, a pastor say, I kind of forget how it went. He said, we're going to go out with a shout, not not home in the moan, with a moan. And that's true. A lot of people are going home with a moan. They say, oh, come, Jesus. I can't deal with it anymore. I can't take it anymore. Well, you know, I know it gets rugged. I know what's going on this earth. But I'm going to tell you something. In Jesus, hey, you're going to keep going. It's not going to cause you to say, oh, Lord, get me out of this mess. Because you're going to be mighty in him. You're going to have his presence there. And let me tell you, when his presence is in and on your life and through your life, no matter what's going on in this world, it's not going to move you. It's not going to move you at all because God is with you. And if God's for you, who can be against you? And it's not just having the knowledge of that, folks, but it, it, you feel it, for lack of a better way to explain it. You sense it. You know that presence that fear goes. When that presence of the Holy Ghost is in you, all fear dispels from you. When God's giftings are in you, the gifts of the Spirit and everything, and I'm not teaching on that tonight. I did do a series on that just recently. But when those gifts are operating through you, you can't not believe because it's God. It's God, you see. So you and I need to look at ourselves and say, is, is the will is supposed to be in heaven, your will done on me and this earth like it's going to be with me in heaven? We need to be a little duplicate of what we're going to be in heaven here, you see. And if we do that, that's going to be the greatest tool winning or soul winning tool that you and I can use. He tells us in, in Proverbs 11:30 that he that wins souls is wise. So if you want to be wise, you win souls. But you're not going to win souls if you're living a, a haphazard life, a sloppy life, up da- one day down the next and crying the blues one next one day and then the next day, oh hallelujah. This thing doesn't get it because people see that and they say, wait a minute now, this person was up one day, down the next, they don't seem to be consistent. Just, uh, how is Jesus here? Is he on one day and off the other? So you see, we need to be consistency. The word faithful, well done now, good and faithful servant, which we all want to hear, being faithful is simply being consistent, not being up once and down again, but being faithful straight across, straight through straight through, you see. And there's no person that anybody respects more than a person that is strong and faithful and is not budged or moved by circumstances or situations. Okay? 
So now we're post. We know what the post be like. His will be done in heaven if we want it done with us on the earth too. He went for the body of Christ, but starting with you and I, his will being done in your life and mine on earth as it would be in heaven. Okay, give us this day our daily bread. Oh, now that is a big one right there. That is a big one too. When you ask for your daily bread, you know what you're asking for? You're asking not just for, a lot of people say, well, money and this and that and jobs. Yes, that's part of it. But you're asking for uh, him to give you wisdom, give you understanding, bring you connections to you, bring you opportunities to win people to Christ, uh, bring people to you, send you to them. Anything that he has for you to do that day from smiling uh, at a person on the street to uh, healing a sick person by, through prayer or giving somebody some money or whatever it be, what do you want me to do this day? Give me that bread. Give me what my day is supposed to be. He has a book in heaven that has Ed's name on it, and I want Ed today to do thus and such. This will happen. That will happen. So I'm saying, all right, Lord, out of your page for this day, I want, I want to have that page in my life, and I want to fulfill it the way you have it penned up there for me. And that's really what it is because that's a fact. He does have things written down daily. There's books in heaven. And anyhow, he has on that page, and I want that page to be fulfilled in my life that day. Now, you might say, well, yeah, it went, what happened there, even though you, you want that page fulfilled, if you miss a day, you'll get it tomorrow. Some things you could, but there might be some things on that page that uh, are going to be done today, and if you miss them, they're gone. So, you see, I don't want to miss them. I heard a pastor say recently that uh, uh, when it came to uh, doing something daily, uh, he'd asked a couple of times. He'd pray in the morning. That's what I do before I get out of bed. I'll pray those things. And uh, and then during the day, too, because, uh, like he said, I don't want to take any chance of missing anything here. I don't want to miss it, right? So when you're asking for your daily bread, you're asking for everything. Maybe he'll need to correct me about something. There's corrections that I need sometimes. I need to know maybe something I need to start doing or stop doing or whatever, you see. But uh, this way, you're not missing anything, folks. When you ask for the daily bread, you're asking for the Father to live through you what he has written down that little piece of paper for, for this day for you. Tomorrow, it would be another day, April the 4th, I believe it is. And what does he have on your page for tomorrow? Give me this day my daily bread. What you have on that page for me, from the good stuff to the things that you want me to do, maybe something you're going to give me a spanking for, something I, I either or something you want to show me or whatever. But I want what you have for me, Lord, because... Like like the old TV show, Father Knows Best. And I accept that, you see. I trust him because whatever he says and does, I trust him because he knows best and it's all going to come out in the end. All things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose, Romans eight twenty eight. Right? Okay. So make sure that you ask for your daily bread always. And that, that's what really brings forth the scripture I quoted a little while ago in Second Peter 1, verse 3 and 4, where we're given a, a exceeding and great precious promises that we can be partakers of his divine nature and, and escape through the corruption which is in the world through lust. And every need that we can have met, you see. He's given us these things. That's, that's all part of that, but that isn't all of it, see. There's many parts of the blessings and the things in the daily bread of God that it covers everything. So you're not going to miss anything in your life when you ask for that daily bread. No, nothing at all, from witnessing to somebody to uh, a person that's supposed to contact you or maybe you contact them. Okay, the next thing, forgive us as we have forgiven. Okay, forgive us, forgive us, forgive us. This is a major one. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, Right? Now, if you look in the 14th and 15th verse here in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, it speaks of if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Then in the 15th verse it says, but if you forget not, forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Okay, let's go back to the 12th verse there. And most people read that verse like this. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debt towards most people say, yes, forgive me of my sins, Lord, forgive me, because you said to pray, ask me, forgive me of my sins. But they kind of leave out the second part there, as we forgive our debtors. And you know what that actually means when you look that up? That means what it says. If I have unforgiveness towards somebody and I go to God, I'm saying, Lord, 
forgive me as I forgive. Well, say Joe, I have something against Joe, we'll say. Uh, okay, as I forgive Joe, forgive me, Lord. And I didn't forgive Joe, I still hold odds against him. I'm going to get the same thing back. That's sowing and reaping, right? Galatians 6, 7 tells us that what a man sows, he reaps, doesn't it? Okay, it's not just in money like a lot of people just use all the time, just money. But if I'm sowing a seed of unforgiveness, I can't expect to be forgiven. Because he even said the verses I just read, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. In Mark eleven twenty five and 26, it says the very same thing. If you don't forgive, your father won't forgive you. So forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That is a that's a sobering thought, folks. We we need to camp here a little bit because I think this is the greatest violation in the body of Christ that they have something against one another. They have something against the pastor. They have a husband has something against the wife. Uh, the child has something against the parents. The parents something with the child, or you have something against your boss at work, or or, or the lady in your church you have something against her, or she has something against you. How many churches? How many churches are there? People in there or at odds with one another. Uh, have an odd or an unforgiveness towards a, another one or sitting there. Yet, they ask for forgiveness. Forgive me, Lord. But he said, as you forgive your debtors. So you see this responsibility, given you receive. Doesn't the word say that? Okay. Luke six thirty eight. Given it shall be given unto you. Give, and it will be given unto you. If you don't give, it won't be given to you, will it? See, that, that's the law of reciprocity or sowing or reaping right there, but we don't consider that. So many times we want forgiveness and mercy of God, but we fail to show it to others. And you all know that story. In the Bible there, remember the man that, uh, that forgave? Uh, in fact, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, reiterate that a little bit. Uh, his uh, master was there, and, of course, uh, he, was going, he got a hold of the guy that owed him the servant, and he wanted to make him pay. And he owed him something like uh, forty million plus, at least forty million dollars. Different translations say more. So he owed him at least forty million dollars. We use it forty million. Okay, he said, "Please have mercy on me. I, I can't pay you. Don't lock me up. I have a family. Don't don't lock me up." And he forgave him. He forgave him that forty million dollars, right? Okay, he walked away, and then somebody owed him some money. I think it was forty dollars, some trifling amount. Now, keep in mind, this man was just forgiven $40 million, and somebody owed him $40, and he asked the same thing of him as he asked of his servant. But this this man didn't give him that grace. He said, no. He said, lock him up until you pay. And then, of course, it got back to the one that forgave him, his master, and then, of course, he got locked back up for it. So you see, that's really a replica of how it is. You know, we, you and I have been forgiven so much. So much like a state of $40 million over the years. When I look at all the things I've been forgiven of, it's mountains of things, okay? And I'm sure you'd say the same thing about yourself. But somebody does something to me, just a trifling thing, and I would get really upset and, oh, I'm not going to forgive them. I'm just, oh, I'm mad at them. It would be just as ridiculous for me to hold on to that of all, after all I've been forgiven of, would it be if somebody forgave me for $40 million, if I owed $40 million, and then they owed me $40, a person I wouldn't forgive them. That would be ridiculous. I'd be so happy for giving $40 million, I'd say, forget it. But you see, we could all say that and laugh. It would sound, wow, who wouldn't forgive? But don't we show in the spiritual that uh, we've been forgiven much, but yet we have a hard heart to not want to forgive somebody else because they offended us. They made us mad. They ruffled our feathers. But you see, that's how ridiculous it looks to the Lord. But he said, if you don't forgive, I can't forgive. And I, that's something we have left out because I've not heard many preachers preaching that. The Lord brought that to me not too terribly long ago, a while back, and I've been kind of riding on that a good bit because I think there's a lot of people are going to be missing the rapture or, or walking out of that, uh, that truth. I'm, I hate to say that. And you say, well, you can't judge that. Well, no, I can't, but I know but what the Bible says here. I'm going by what the Bible is saying. So if Jesus meant what he said there, neither will your father forgive you. Hey, Jesus said it. I didn't say it. I'm quoting it to say, I don't want to take a chance on it. I surely don't want to miss the rapture because I have a, a odds against a man or a woman for something or another. So we need to make sure 
when we go to the Father, forgive me as I've forgiven others because I forgive everybody. I forgive everybody that has come against me. And you, you need to do that tonight. If there's people that, as I speak this message, you can do it now or when we uh, close or whatever, but you need to get that off your chest. If you have unforgiveness, you need to get that going because nothing I can say here tonight will benefit you to you get rid of that. Nothing will benefit you because we have to have a, a pure heart, a clean heart, a forgiving heart. And that, that is a, that's a bottom foundation of everything. So we must have that forgiveness, forgiving the people. So forgive and you will be forgiven. And it's pretty easy to ask forgiveness when you forgive others because you get in a, it's a flow. In other words, somebody does something, sometimes it might be a little rough now that they do something, but hey, not my will, but thy will, so I will forgive you, Lord. And when you forgive, it's not because you feel like it. You might feel like popping them one, but yet because the Lord says you must forgive, an act of your free will, you do it. Go like Jesus. You know, when he was going to the cross uh, in, in uh, Gethsemane, he was at the place there. He didn't want to go, but he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And that's what gives you and I, gave you and I the victory over that will that I taught on last week there when he swept the drops of blood. That uh, Whenever he was there agonizing, going to the cross, those drops of blood covered us we have the ability to say not my will but your will father no matter what we face that gives us the strength and the ability through the holy ghost to do like he did there you see and we're never going to have anything excruciating like that that we say lord never let's not my will but die because jesus went through the ultimate so need to keep that in mind need to keep that in mind okay the next thing is temptation and evil now as you read that there and you know that would be ridiculous as it is in the King James. Uh, it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, when does God lead us into temptation? So you see, there's the, the King James is a translation. It's not a perfect translation. That's why you look in the Hebrew and the Greek, because God is not a tempter. You can't tempt God, and he doesn't tempt you. Lead us not into temptation. I'm not going to say, Father, don't lead me to temptation. You don't lead me to temptation. The Lord tests us. He doesn't tempt us. He never tempts us. The devil is a tempter. God tests us, but he doesn't tempt us. So what that actually means right there, to show you another thing in there, what it's actually meaning, is don't let us fall into temptation by the enemy that will take us and draw us aside. And don't let him come against us to, to ruin what we're doing. In other words, protect us there in that situation. Because you're not going to lead us into him. You're going to protect us. And that's really what it's saying to us. Of course, he's given us uh, authority over the devil. He's given us power of the devil. We have authority over the spirits. So we have the authority to cast them out, to cast them down, and to say no to them, you see. And we have the authority over our will. So we have the authority over our will. We have the authority over the devil. We don't have authority over the others, per se, to force them into anything because God doesn't even use that. A person's will, you, you can't force somebody's will. That's one thing we never do. In fact, that's called witchcraft when I try to force somebody's will into doing something I want, you say. But uh, when it comes to the devil, when it comes to your will, you have authority where you can say, no, I'm going to do what the Father wants, and you can say, get out, devil, in the name of Jesus, and he'll go. Okay? Now, he says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Well, this is an ongoing thing, the power and the glory. And, you know, when we're in heaven, we're going to be in the power and the glory of God. We're going to be in that presence. And there won't be any effort to anything. We're going to be there. There will be no more pain, suffering, trials, tribulations, or anything. But on this earth is where you and I are facing these obstacles. This is sort of like a proving ground to you and I. In fact, it is a proving ground. God gave us a free will to make a free choice, you see. And he's made provisions with his son through his son with the plan of salvation, which gives us the, uh, the ability to live an abundant and fruitful life. As, as Jesus said in, uh, in uh, John 10, 10, I've come to, you might have life, you might have it more abundantly. And he's offered us all that. He's given us the offer that we cannot refuse. But I think what happens a lot of times, people uh, see... Uh, other people and what they're reflecting as Christianity is not too appetizing to them. They're not really showing the real Jesus that brings an impression. 
you know yourself, there's people out here right now, and I know you know what I'm talking about, many of you. There's things that you've done sometimes that has moved the hearts of people, and you knew it was something the Lord had you do, and it moved their hearts, it touched their hearts. This is what we're talking about here, and it's doing what the Holy Spirit leads you to do, obeying the Word, because when you obey the Word of God, you listen to the Holy Spirit and just do what He wants, and you walk in love towards people, uh, what you do will be anointed, and it's going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference, you see. It will make a difference. And I'll tell you this, there's a greater anointing that's coming on God's people that are obedient now. I'm personally seeing it in a powerful way. These past couple of weeks have been uh, special times, and it's progressively going into what God had promised because we're the last day remnant. God's anointing his people to go forth like never before. It's a stronger anointing. What it is, it's an anointing of power, his power in us, and also an anointing for finances. They're the two major things, plus healings and miracles and things. And many things are happening now. I'm seeing them happen, not even seeing them. Matter of fact, you won't even recognize the power of God in you all the time, the anointing through you, until somebody testifies to you what happened when you ministered to them. That's what the other day I had that happen to me where I didn't recognize it because it's not like you're having any great feelings all the time or goosebumps or something like that, but you're just simply flowing along. But God puts his anointing on it, and sometimes you sense it very strongly. Other times it, you don't. I've seen God open blind eyes, and nobody fell out under the Spirit, laid hands and ministered to him, and uh, nothing uh, extraordinary. Did anybody thought anything magnificent happened, jumping all over the place? Blind out open. I've seen these things happen so many times, you know, and it's not in our outward gyrations all the time to get the job done. It's by the anointing. Not by power and might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Zechariah 4, 6. And by the Holy Ghost and by the Holy Spirit, God is setting you free tonight as the Lord prayed. Because as the Lord prayed his prayer, thy will be done in your life on earth as it is in heaven. God's will be done in your life is on this earth as it already is set up for in heaven. I want you to show me in this earth here, Jesus said. I want you to show me. I want you to demonstrate me. I want you to receive my blessings in your life. I want you to use those blessings and, and sow those blessings to others that people will see my love and my goodness in mankind. He wants to show his love and goodness through you. He blesses you to be a blessing. He wants you prosperous financially, physically, mentally, in every way, anointing-wise, in every area that you can give, that you can give of what you have because he didn't give it to you to hoard. He gave it to you to enjoy and to give back out, and that's what this is all about. So what I'm going to do tonight is I do this again. I'm going to read the Lord's Prayer, and I want you to think about what we talked about here. And I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit is going to touch you where you need touch. I don't know what you need. I don't know. But the Holy Spirit knows. And I'm going to read this very slowly, these verses that I read earlier right here, verse Matthew 6, 9 through 13. And I'm going to read them slowly. I want you just to sit back there with your eyes closed right now. I want you to forget about anything. You'll hear my voice. But you're not thinking about me. You're just hearing the words. And you're thinking about Jesus. Just see Jesus there. I want you to focus on Jesus. And I'm going to read this. I want you to focus on him and open your hearts up. In fact, turn your hands around just as I read this. Because when you turn your palms up towards heaven, that's like open your hands so he can feel. He can feel you. That's receiving. I'm receiving from you, Lord. That's a sign of receiving. When you turn your hands around, you hold them in the air, that's receiving from him. I want you to do that as I read, and whatever he has for you, receive tonight. Whatever he has. I'm believing it because I know the anointing's here to do that very thing. And you will receive, and I'm going to ask you too. Uh, you have a responsibility. The Bible says in Psalms 105.1 that we're to make known his deeds to the people, and I want you to contact uh, the station right here. I have a website you can contact us on there. Uh, on my uh, program, it's on Reaching Out Radio right there. You'll see mine and, and Montavendis Montel. You can contact her because hers is there. It's uh, recognizable. What you can mark that. It, it makes no difference who you're notified. Just make sure it's notified because we want to honor the Lord with your testimonies and we want to encourage others. They see our God is real. That's that's the biggest thing to testify because the more testimonials that go forth, the greater it is because, hey, so many times people have requests. 
where the testimony is at. My God does sing. That's why this program, that's why the Lord gave me this program, God's Word in Action. It's not just God's Word. It's not just something we talk about and teach about and, oh, we believe this, we believe that. But, hey, it really works, folks. It really works. It brings forth fruit. It's a lifestyle that brings forth fruit and gives us the abundancy in all things and, and lifts us up above the clouds. Amen? Okay, are you all ready to receive right now? Amen. I am I'm here with you receiving myself, too. Amen. Here we go. I want you to receive. Thank you, Lord. We just ask you just to move upon your people right now. Those, whatever the needs might be, as I read this here, that your anointing would just fall upon the people, as you instructed me to read this, Father. So I'm going to read it, and Lord, we just release the Holy Spirit to do his work in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen, and amen, and amen. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. We just praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just praise him and thank him for meeting you right now, whatever your need was. Whatever your oh, Yes, yes. Whatever that need, whatever that need is. Yes, just keep those hands up there. Just keep those hands up there. And just allow the Holy Spirit to feed you and minister to you. It's just you and Jesus. Just you and Jesus, the atmosphere. The atmosphere is Jesus. You and Jesus, because he wants to do a work in your life. He wants your life to be on this earth as it would be in heaven. He wants it for you. It's his will. He desires it. He will make it happen. You just let him do it. Let him do it. Thank you, Lord. 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 Praise you, Jesus. Okay. Okay, as we... Here, I'm going to share with you. I'm going to give you my email, and I know the other emails you'll have to uh, notify the broadcasting we have here, Reaching Out Radio, because it's very important that you tell what God has done in these programs, not just my program, but any program we have here, because... <clears throat> 